I'm Stone Cold Steve Austin. I'm honored to have been connected with three very special men. Tanker veterans from World War II. Walter, uh, it's good to talk with you, and thank you very much for your service. My pleasure. Let's start with how you got in the Army and where you were when the war started. Okay, I served in World War II. I was a tank gunner. I was with E Company of the 33rd Armored Regiment of the 3rd Armored Division. My father told me, he said, well, when you get in, don't tell them you're a truck driver. Tell them you're a student. He said, maybe they'll send you to school. So when I got to, to the first place down in Camp Polk, and he said, oh, I see you're a truck driver. I said, I don't want anything with a steering wheel. I said, okay. So he sent me over and I became a tanker. And there was, he's probably still laughing because tanks had levers. When we got over to Omaha Beach, the weather was bad, so we rode anchor for three days, which made an awful lot of people sick. Then we finally, they decided we could go in. So we got on these landing craft and they took us into Omaha Beach. And I walked up that road that's so famous on the pictures of Omaha Beach. Went in about, uh, oh, maybe a mile or so. And they said, uh, dig a foxhole. So I dug my first foxhole. And I found out that night why I needed a foxhole. Because a German bomber came over, they called him Bedcheck Charlie. The bomber came over, dropped a bunch of bombs just indiscriminately. I mean, he could see where the spotlights were coming from and the whole yak act and that sort of thing. And he just dropped it right there and killed a number of people a couple hundred yards away from me. So I knew then whenever they said dig a foxhole, I was one of the ones who grabbed the shovel and started. What was it like the first time being shot at? Uh, I was sitting in the half track and all of a sudden a sniper shot at me and just missed a oh, matter of a couple of inches. And I screamed and ducked down and he fired again at somebody else and still missed again. So he must have been anxious in a hurry. And they put a bazooka in the church steeple and that took care of that, but we moved on. So I don't know how things went. Was your tank ever hit? If the tank got hit, Usually somebody was killed. That was the that was the sad part. Uh, if you if you saw a tank get hit, you knew that something somebody was going to get it. That was sad. Uh, we got a, over the radio. Uh, another uh, person, I think, was the other uh, platoon leader, screaming. I said, "Back up, lieutenant! They're shooting at you." Well, just when he said that, I turned up my periscope like this and saw this red fireball go by. And then they called him again, said, Lieutenant, back up, they're shooting at you. And uh, then he reached up and slowly grabbed his mic button and squeezed the mic button. And just when he did, bang, that shell went through and killed the gunner and the tank commander. And the gunner fell backwards, the tank commander fell forwards and I couldn't get by them. I tried, you know, but they, they were, weren't going to move. And in my peripheral vision, I saw daylight. The driver left his, got out and the hatch was open. So I dove down the driver's seat and got out and dove over the side of the tank. The uh, Third Armored Division had uh, more killed in action than the 101st Airborne. We had over 22,000 dead. We lost 600 and some tanks. That's a lot of tanks. Tell us about some of your different tank commanders. Was that a difficult job? We were positioning our tank in between a couple buildings to kind of hide it. Uh, didn't think there was anybody around that would give us any trouble. And uh, so uh, Sergeant Jones got out and was backing the driver up. And all of a sudden a mortar shell hit and just really just destroyed his leg. So we called for the medics, and then we called and said, we need another tank commander. So then I got a, another tank commander, and this tank commander had come in on D-Day, and his tank got hit, and he got burnt badly. Uh, he got out in the, in the uh, 
gunner got out and the rest of his crew drowned. The tank just sunk. And so he'd spent months in the hospital. Now that was on D-Day and he came up to us, it's in September. And he came back and he was my tank commander for not terribly long, I don't think it was even a week. And we got into it one day and when things calmed down, he just climbed out of the tank. He said, I can't take it, I can't take it. Just turn around and walk back. So we called back and told him to get the medics. So the guy needs help, you know, so uh, he was gone. Then uh, I got my next tank commander and this, and this was my last tank commander. What type of things did you witness from the enemy? These SS troopers were given orders not to take prisoners that um, they couldn't feed them, they couldn't spare the people to take care of them, it would only slow them down, so don't take prisoners. And these SS troopers got in there and lined them all up in a, in a bar and shot them all. Uh, this one little girl, two-year-old, her mother fell on her and bled all over, and the Germans thought she was dead. So when the Germans left and the men came back to this village of Profondry, uh, they realized this little girl was alive, and they took her to our medics because they didn't have a hospital or anything there. And our doctors, our medics, said there wasn't a scratch on her. And I met her some 50 years later. You know, she was the sole survivor of the women and children in that little village. How long did it take before you were able to talk about the war? You know, I don't think I ever talked with my parents about it at all. Uh, I didn't really talk much about it until I started going to reunions. Uh, of third armored people and I'd get together with these fellows from my company, from my E company, and we shared a lot together. You know, they, we'd been through a lot of hell together. It made a real comradeship out of it. If you interview other tankers, they'll tell you the same thing. You know, it's, I changed crews because some are getting killed, you know, that sort of thing. But the ones that I was with, uh, for through three tanks, we got to be real good friends. Walter, thank you very much for sharing your story. Uh, and again, appreciate your service. My name is Clarence Edward Sawyer. I was born in uh, Perryville, Pennsylvania. I served in World War II the United States Army, 3rd Armored Division, and I, I was a corporal gunner. We went to England first, trained there. When uh, D-Day came, we went across the channel and landed at Omaha Beach. And the beach was under control, so there was no problem there. We were waterproof for about three or four feet of, of water we could handle. I, at that time, I was in a loader. My arm got all blistered from loading the shells so fast and the, the fumes and uh, fire coming out the back and it blistered my arm. On the way back from the medics to my tank, I heard it pop. I, and I knew a motor was on its way. So I ran like a oil, climbing, and just I was going down into the top. It exploded on a, a, a building right beside us, and something came over and uh, ripped my nose open from the tip here all the way back to my, my lip. But anyway, uh, I, I survived. I, just, uh, I didn't even go back down to the medics because I was afraid they'd get me with a motor. Did your tank ever get hit? Uh, we got hit with a armor-piercing shell hit on the gun tube, and it like scooped a big, big spoon full of metal out of there, and then ricocheted up over. If, if it had been six inches over more, I, I would have got right through my telescopic sight. I, I wouldn't be here to tell the story. We, we had some brave men. The motor motors were flying there. And, and, uh, all of a sudden, on one of the open top uh, vehicles got, got hit with the motor and they were screaming. My tank commander, commander, the eyes of how we say he, he was the best tank commander in the army. He got out, I tried tried to stop him, 
I thought it was a tough one not to go on, but he wouldn't dare. He, he always ran to help help somebody if they were in need. So I watched my, in my sight, and he ran down that narrow road. And when he got just to the point where he was going to go up, the, up behind the trees, two more shells landed beside him. It, it blew his body up on the bank. Later on, as the medics came, and I, I said, he, is, he, is he dead? They said, yeah, he died instantly. So, uh, he was a brave, brave man and a very, very good guy. I, I lost my best friend there. When was the first time you engaged a German tank? There's a German tank right at the back of the Cologne Cathedral in that big patio. And we were going to go in, into the intersection so I could get a good shot. But by that time, the German tank had backed away. So I, I shot through the building. It was a, like a three-story building. And on the bottom were pillars and then a lot of glass and stuff. I shot through thinking I would get all of the hit. The whole top fell down on top of it. I didn't know it at the time, but it fell on top of the German tank. We, we finished fighting there and we captured that uh, crew from, from the tank that was on our side. And later on, I, I met him when we, they took me over at Cologne and asked me if I would talk to him. I woke up, and I, I hesitated. I didn't know how he was going to feel about me. After all, I dropped the building on top of him. But I, I went up, and I extended my hand, and he, he gave me his hand. I shook hand. I said, the word's over now. We can be friends. Thank you very much for the stories, Clarence. Very much appreciate your service, and I think those stories can certainly inspire anyone. Joe, thank you very much for your service. Tell me how you got into the Army. At that time, we were all 18, 20, 19 years old, and most everybody, every male in the United States wanted to do their part. And we, were, we felt betrayed by the Japanese and we were willing to sign up. The, the captain would assign somebody to be the lead tank. And uh, that was a very scary time when they said, okay, Joe Caserta, you're going they never use first names. They said, okay, Caserta, you're going to lead off today. I went from the hedgerows all the way to uh, France, Belgium, Germany, and then and we traveled 90 miles in one night to get back to, to the Balch. And we stayed there till it was over. I lived in my tank for weeks at a time. The Third Armored Division, we were a close unit and uh, Nazi when you lived in it, when you had a tank crew there's five members and you became very close and we treated each other with respect and dependent on each other everybody had their own position and and job did the tank make you feel safe at all we felt safe as far as small arms fire and uh, because they would ping off the tank but as far as the German 88 or the Panzerfaust, which is uh, equivalent to a, a bazooka, we, we didn't stand a chance. Did you ever hear from your family back home? One time they sent me a package and it was a loaf of an Italian bread. And here it was, uh, my mother hollowed it out and put a pint bottle of booze, booze in it for me. That's the only way we could smuggle it in. Tell me how you received your Purple Heart. I was at the time a tank driver. I was all buttoned up 
couldn't see much. And all of a sudden, I ran into a bomb crater and the tank was teetering like it's gonna fall over. Well, when the tank is stopped in combat, you get the hell out. You don't stay there because they're gonna, you know they're gonna hit it. So we all bailed out and uh, headed back towards the rear lines. There was all kind of artillery fire and small arms fire. So we went back and then the next thing you know, an artillery shell came in ground level and exploded behind us. I was knocked out, I had a concussion. I was out, knocked out for a little while. I had a hole in my helmet. My watch got hit and my shoulder was really burning. But when I came to, I, I, my buddy was up on top of me and I shook him and here his head was blown off. He was my tank commander. So they, I peeled, they peeled off my clothes and treated the wounds, pulled out the shrapnel and sent me back to my outfit. They made me a tank commander after that point. Well, the worst was uh, knowing that if you got hit with anything, you're gonna, it's gonna go right through the tank and you're gonna burn up and catch fire. My greatest fear was of burning up in the tank, which a lot of guys did, but thank God it didn't happen to me. Were you proud of what you did in the war? Yeah, that I served my country and uh, did whatever was asked of me and survived. There's not, any, not much more I can say about that. How was it to see Clarence again? It was wonderful to see him again because I'm starting to get a little depressed and uh, feel that I don't have too much time left. And I've had such a good life. I was married for 70 years. This and, uh, and I feel sad that it's going to end. Such a good life afterwards. And uh, we keep in touch every week. I call him on the phone. And last year he came down down the shore and stayed with me overnight one time. And we went up and I took him to the flag raising. And yeah, it's, it's wonderful to be able to see him. There's not many of us outside of Walter. And we were the last three at the uh, reunion in Philadelphia for the Third Armor Association. How were you received back here in America? Well, I, I, a lot of people, as I'm riding by and all, I have two flags on my scooter and a sign saying Third Armor Division and so, and so many people would say thank you for your service and, and it's very well appreciated. The women used to come up and kiss me on the cheek and shake hands and everything, you know, and it made you feel very proud. And I feel, and I tell them that, make sure they t teach this, you know, the younger generation what people have suffered through. And thank them for Remember, thank you, Joe. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. And once again, thank you so much for your service. And to all the veterans, Joe, Clarence, and Walter, thank you for sharing your stories and thank you for your service and sacrifice to this country. On behalf of the WWE, War Gaming, and We Are the Mighty, I hope you all got as much inspiration as we did by hearing these stories. I'm Stone Cold Steve Austin. Soldier on.